Hello everyone and welcome to this installment of the Coalition of Master Scholars on Material Cultures Foundations Lecture Series. My name is Logan Ward and I'm an editor with CMSMC. This lecture serves as an introduction to, overview, or review of Edward Said's book, Orientalism, 1978. Anyone engaging with the book, whether undergraduate, graduate, or postgraduate, should find this lecture helpful. I attempt to cover all of the main points and examples from Said's book, but I add my own exercises to demonstrate how Orientalism appears in everyday life. Before I get into the lecture, I would like to introduce and position myself. I received my MA in East Asian Studies at The Ohio State University in spring 2021, where my research and thesis focused on the interpretation and representation of Korean civilization and people through material culture at the Cleveland Museum of Art in the early 20th century. Edward Said's Orientalism served as an important theoretical basis for my research, and I am indebted to his work. However, I would like to state that I am a gay, white, Euro-American, non-binary man who grew up in a middle-class suburban family in Ohio. Therefore, it is likely that my own internalized biases and social privileges incorporate my understanding of Said's Orientalism. But I would like to state that I strive to recognize and interrogate these privileges in my own research and in this lecture. If you find any issues with my interpretation and representation of Said's work, please reach out to me in the comments and I will do my best to address any issues. For this lecture, I have three goals in mind that are for you, the audience, but also more for me to make sure that I am doing my job in this lecture. The first is to make sure that you understand Said's theorization of Orientalism as three distinct but interdependent things. So this lecture is actually organized based upon Said's theorization, and I will be reviewing in three different sections each of these in detail. First, we will look at a style of thought based upon the East-West binary. Second, we will look at a European academic discipline concerning the Orient. Third, we will look at a Western means of dominating the Orient. The next goal is to make sure that you can recognize and critically think about Orientalism as it occurs in daily life and scholarship. To do this, I and some of my friends will offer different anecdotes and examples specific to material and visual culture that reflect how globally pervasive Orientalism is. Many of them will be historical, but some of them are more contemporary to the 21st century. The final goal is to make sure that you have the tools that you need to interrogate Orientalism, if you so choose, in your own research. Of course, covering Said's Orientalism in this lecture and listening to others interrogate it in their own examples will be helpful. But to help you even more, I will dedicate the final section to giving you further resources and helpful strategies that you can use to start off looking at Orientalism. All quotes in this lecture are based upon this edition of Edward Said's Orientalism. Part 1. What is Orientalism? So by now you are probably wondering, what is Orientalism? I have said it many times already, and I have not clarified. But I ask you to bear with me just a bit longer, because before I give you an answer, it is important that you start to think about the term for yourself. So what we are going to do is a little reflection exercise to get us thinking. Here are the three important terms that will occur again and again in this lecture. Orientalism, Orient, and Oriental. What I would like you to do is take about five minutes, more or less, and try to think of a specific time when you use these terms. You heard someone else use these terms, or if you do not have a specific experience with these terms, consider what you are thinking right now. Consider these questions while you think. Number one, who was that person slash who are you? Really position yourself or that person in a similar way to how I introduced myself. Number two, what did you think that person meant when they used these terms? What do you think these terms mean? Did that person mean harm, or were they being passive? To whom was that person referring? Who was that person describing? What follow-up information did that person give to clarify? Number three, how did those words make you feel? Do these words offend you, make you feel awkward, make you feel nothing in particular, maybe even make you laugh, etc.? Go ahead and pause to reflect. When I was in high school, I was at my aunt's house visiting with my parents and my two younger siblings. 
My aunt is a white working class woman who was born in the 1950s. She is a devout Christian and a proud conservative Republican. During the visit, I was explaining to my aunt that I wanted to go to college and learn Korean and study in Korea and maybe even live there someday. Although I do not remember the exact quotes of how my aunt replied, it went something like this. My aunt, well, when I went to Korea in the 70s, it was dirty and everyone was rude. Anyways, when you go to those kinds of places, you find out all those Orientals look the same and no one speaks English. Why would you want to go and live there? Me, you can't say Orientals like that. It's offensive. My aunt, well, when I was growing up, that's what we called them. So at the time, I was really heartbroken by what she said for several reasons, but I did not continue the conversation because I was a teenager and I did not know what to say about it. First of all, I was very excited about this place called Korea and wanted everyone else to be too. I was also taken aback when my aunt used the term Orientals, but at the time, I did not completely understand why this was offensive. I just knew that the term was outdated. But let's take a closer look at what my aunt means, not just what she said. There are many things that are obviously racist and problematic with what my aunt said here, but I would like to focus on the us versus them mentality that my aunt exhibits in this conversation. Particularly important is how she makes broad, overarching, descriptive statements about many different groups of people and the places that they inhabit. There are, of course, Korean people, who she calls rude, and then Korea as a place that she calls dirty but she extends this judgment into a broader group of people and places as well that she calls Oriental. Then when my aunt references speaking English, she demonstrates that her opinion is actually a comparison of this generalized Orient and Oriental that she had been talking about to us or she and I who speak English. And she confirms this when she states that that's what her so-called we called them when she was growing up. And this is Orientalism in its most basic form. It is the proposition that there is a white European or Euro-American us and an Asian them, two opposites that are inherently different and always in juxtaposition with one another so that the so-called West seems superior to the so-called East. And Orientalism interprets and organizes the world based upon this assumption. At this point, you may have noticed that Orientalism and what people today call anti-Asian racism are rather similar. And if my anecdote were to consider a time when someone used the term Oriental to refer to people from the Middle East and North Africa, or perceived Muslim people, you would probably notice that Orientalism and Islamophobia are also rather similar. It is true. Racism and prejudices against people of certain religious backgrounds are all integral aspects of Orientalism. But it is erroneous to merely dismiss Orientalism as an individual's hateful prejudice. Instead, Orientalism has structured anti-Asian, Islamophobic, and many other biases, prejudice, racisms, etc. throughout the world in a variety of ways. Today, we are going to use Edward Said's opus on Orientalism to understand how that came about and what that looks like. So, who was Edward Said and why did he write about Orientalism? Said was born in Palestine during the 1930s to a Lebanese mother and an American father. He grew up going to Western educational institutions between Cairo and Jerusalem before he was expelled from Victoria College in Cairo in 1951. After that, he moved over to a boarding school in Massachusetts in the United States. He went to receive his first degree in English from Princeton University and then continued his education at Harvard in English Literature. Eventually, he became faculty in English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University, where he became full professor in 1992. Of course, he ended up teaching and holding positions all over the United States during his tenure and implemented many lecture series more globally. Said spends a good amount of time qualifying how his disheartening personal experience as a Palestinian living in the West inspired him to work on Orientalism. As I mentioned earlier, Edward Said's book titled Orientalism was first published in 1978. Even though it has been over 40 years, universities and scholars continue to teach and discuss the book today. I think there are three main reasons for this, most of which are just my opinion or observations and are perfectly debatable. First of all, Said's book is really the only major work to deal with the topic from a broad historical perspective, and it does it rather seamlessly. He covers everything from ancient Greece through the book's contemporary 1970s, and he addresses everything from literature to policy to education and to visual culture. So even if there are places here or there that need to be readdressed, argued against, or further explained, 
It does not take too much to build off of the framework that Said designed in his book. And of course, there have been many, many responses for and against Said's Orientalism, but as we will see, most of them are not as monumental as his original work. The second reason that the book has lasted seems to be because of to whom Said was responding and from whom Said was building in his own work. You may have heard of something called postmodernism. Said himself knew and admired many postmodern theorists such as Michel Foucault, Noam Chomsky, and Louis Althusser, and he specifically situates his book as building off of their work in some aspects. Particularly important to Said's Orientalism is the postmodern concept of knowledge as subjective and created rather than objective and universal. Similar to postmodernism, Said's work became integral to postcolonial discourses, especially related to North Africa, the Middle East, and other predominantly Islamic areas of the world. And the final reason that the book has lasted is probably because Orientalism has not been dislodged from any structure of global hegemony. Western nation states and empires, particularly the United States, continue to dominate the so-called East. Anti-Asian racism, Islamophobia, and xenophobia continue to pervade global politics and popular culture, especially as North Korea, China, Iran, Syria, Palestine, etc. continue to flood European and settler colonial North American media and politics as possible major threats to so-called Western civilization. Finally, public institutions such as universities, museums, and libraries continue to operate based upon Orientalist assumptions, although now the term Orient has become taboo. Instead of Eastern philosophy, students now take Asian philosophy. Instead of Oriental art, museums display Asian art. If there was any time to interrogate and fight against Orientalism, it was yesterday. And Said was fully aware of all of these things, and it was his hope that his book challenged them. I find that these quotes from the introduction describe his intent rather clearly. You can pause and take a minute to read them for yourself. Essentially, what Said attempts to do is understand what Orientalism is, what Orientalism does, and how it structures the world. And he theorized that Orientalism works as three distinct but interdependent things. Again, you may pause to read the quotes. So, as we follow Said's theorization, Orientalism is an academic discipline for studying the Orient. Orientalism is a way of thinking based upon the East-West binary and all of the juxtaposing superior-inferior tropes that that binary entails. And Orientalism is a Western means of dominating the Orient. Let's start first with how Orientalism thinks. Part 2. Orientalism as a Style of Thought Orientalism as a way of thinking proposes that there exists two distinct geocultural entities, one called the East and one called the West. As a way of thinking, Orientalism relies on the juxtaposition of these two places and the peoples who inhabit them. Said argues that this is a predominantly Western phenomenon that has historically served to set the West apart from the East as a superior geographical and cultural entity. But what is the East or Orient and what is the West or Occident? The term Orient and Occident are derived from the Latin terms meaning rising or east and falling or west, respectively, but this does not tell us much about what these two places are, what they look like, or how they are supposedly so different. Let's look at this artwork by Maria Bacchus. Take a minute to pause and do some slow looking at this piece. Think about, number one, where is the west as presented in this artwork, and what symbols and terms are associated with it? Number two, where's the East as presented in this artwork, and what symbols and terms are associated with it? Number three, how are the two made distinct from one another in the artwork? My interpretation. So, starting with the West, it takes up the geographical space that I anticipated, namely continental Europe. I noticed that the artist depicted several architectural symbols, such as what I perceive to be Big Ben in London, the Eiffel Tower in Paris, and stereotypical Greco-Roman pillars and a pavilion. I know that these types of things are typically described as monumental or technologically advanced, 
and I know that Greco-Roman architecture is associated with a sense of classicality and high culture. I also noticed the paper wrapped with a ribbon, which makes me think of a diploma, which I then associate with being highly educated or scholarly. There is also a crown that looks like something a stereotypical king would wear, which then makes me think of royalty, wealth, and power. I also see the words progress, developed, civilization, and explorers. I personally find that the architectural icons and what I perceive to be a diploma go along especially well with my preconceived notions about progress, development, and civilization. On the other hand, the East seems to take up a very large geographical area of the world. It seems to be the continent of Asia, but the placement of the label the East makes it a bit vague. What stands out to me in particular is the human figure that takes up what I know to be the Middle East. I find it particularly interesting that their face is mostly covered aside from their eyes. This makes me want to describe the figure as mysterious. I notice their headpiece and a little bit of hair revealing through it, and that makes me think the human is a woman. Pink is also a color typically associated with femininity. I notice a camel and palm trees as well, which makes me think of the desert, which I first associate with heat, and second, desolation or nothingness. Then there is also a shiny golden lamp that makes me think of a particular animated movie about a magical genie and a poor boy. And there is also a dragon, which makes me think of something exotic, but fun, magical, and adventurous. There are also two swords crossing one another, which could really go a couple of ways. I tend to think of coats of arms when I look at this, which to me indicates bloodline or loyalty, but I could also see maybe someone thinking of a sword fight. I see what I perceive to be a lotus flower in bloom, which I associate with peace, but it also makes me think of Buddhism or Hinduism, particularly because it is depicted in the Indian subcontinent. The big red fan also stands out to me as something maybe feminine that can be used to be mysterious by hiding behind it, but it also reminds me of beauty because I think fans are fabulous. Finally, the terms that appear are danger with an exclamation point, magic, nomad, it's exotic, oriental, and there's a big colonized written over the area. To me, these terms seem to work well with the symbols that take up the space as I have talked about them. What really stands out to me in the artwork is how there is a thick black border drawn between Europe and Asia, and also between what I know to be the United States and its northern and southern neighbors of Canada and Mexico. But outside of that, the borders are less obvious. For example, the upper and lower halves of Asia are only separated by the symbols and colors that take up their spaces, not a thickly drawn black line. The same goes for Africa and the Middle East. I also noticed that while Europe is coated in gray, the rest of the continents are more colorful, which really juxtaposes Europe and everyone else. And the terms written within Europe and the terms written within Asia tend to be opposites of one another. Particularly, I think civilization and exotic are antinomous. So as you can see, there are a lot of ideas, symbols, and words associated with the East and the West, and each entity has their own bank of associated representations. And that is what Said also noticed, and he found to be the basis for Orientalism in all its forms. It was not that Orientalism was a concrete and objective way of understanding the East, but rather that it was a system of representations that were being continuously produced and reproduced, structured and restructured, purposed and repurposed in Western thought, scholarship, art, literature, etc. Likewise, these representations, as this artwork exemplifies, position the Orient in a variety of negative oppositions to the Occident. The Orient is distant, exotic, mysterious, undeveloped, desolate, primitive, magical, ancient, dangerous, backward, etc. And the Occident is here, civilized, understandable, developed, advanced, scientific, secure, modern, forward, etc. And there are many more Orientalist tropes we could probably come up with, but at base the Orient is supposed to be overall completely other from anything Western. Said traced these representations as far back as ancient Greece. He particularly used this excerpt from Aeschylus's The Persians. This scene depicts the despair of the Persians led by King Xerxes, who have been defeated by the Greeks. You can take a moment to pause and read it. <laughs> 
What Saeed notes about this excerpt is how Asia in this case is speaking not for itself, but rather from the imagination of a European, or specifically Greek, writer. And Asia, taking the place of the Persian Empire in this case, is represented as all of those things we just discussed. Empty, lost, demolished, glorious in the past under Darius, but at present under ruin due to Xerxes. Said finds a similar trend in European literature from the 17th and 18th century as well, particularly through Barthélemy d'Herbelot's Bibliothèque Orientale that reduced Islam to a mere imitation of Christianity, a religion wanting to be something European but failing. In the 19th century, Said also finds this kind of speaking for the Orient representation in the work of Karl Marx, who in his essays on India posited that British imperialism, thus the West, would bring about what he interpreted as the regeneration of a fundamentally lifeless Asia, putting Asia on track to the eventual global socialist revolution. Similarly, Gustave Flaubert represented the Oriental woman, and by extension the Orient, as a whole as a sexual, promiscuous, exotic, luxuriant being or place reminiscent of Parisian hedonism throughout his writing. And interestingly, when we see all of these representations of the Orient placed next to one another, we notice, or at least I do, that there's not so much of a consistent singular interpretation of the Orient, aside from it being something completely other and often inferior to its Occidental counterpart and always being compared to something European. The Orient, as told by Durbelot, is a failed imitation of Europe. As told by Marx, it's a lifeless and hopeless place without Europe. As told by Flaubert, it's sexual and exciting. And as told by Aeschylus, it was once glorious, but now fallen. And this is why Said suggests that there really is no singular Orient, but rather many different Orients, each created and imagined by its representer. So it is more accurate to say that there is a Durbelot Orient, a Marx Orient, a Flaubert Orient, etc. And even further, Aeschylus and Marx suggest the difference between a former Orient and a present Orient, or a modern Orient and a future Orient, respectively. So Said suggests that the Orient acts more as the stage upon which the author creates and thrusts these representations. Said calls this process of creation orientalization. Therefore, we can say that Asia, the Middle East, and the peoples who live there are orientalized, or made into the Orient or the Oriental, specifically by a European representer. But these representations became more than just ideas that European men held about the general qualities of their orientalized others. These representations also evidenced a geographical division of the world between the East and the West, and this resulted in a both perceived and eventually built border between Europe and the Orient. Said termed this as an imaginative geography, because the spaces indicated by the division were not only physical, but also qualitatively oppositional. Land became the people, and the people became the land. The Orient was its own world, and the Occident was its own world. Thus, what are abstract ideas about the European's perceived other took on very real physical implications, and as we will see later, European empires acted with this division in mind. However, the geographical division also complicates the ability for one to orientalize, because the East, as Orientalism graphs it, and as we saw in Maria Bacchus' artwork, is a very large area of the world. And because it is such a large area of the world, the people who live there also become very difficult to generalize. So again, there becomes multiple Orients, a Near Orient, a Far Orient, an Islamic Orient, Hindu Orient, Buddhist Orient, etc., all of which are generalized representations based on region, culture, language, or what have you, made by European representer. And when I put it this way, you might think, but this logic isn't saying Islamic Orient and Islamic world basically the same thing. And Said would say yes, and has argued against the concept of an Islamic world. And I personally agree with him. Because the main assumption that founds both of these terms are that, one, there exists a confined space in which all people who believe in Islam exist, and that, two, all people who believe in Islam are the same and therefore generalizable. And if we interpret the world through Orientalism, we would assume that this is true. But in reality, that is a rather difficult claim to support because, for example, even one of the most basic aspects of Islam as a religion 
is that there are different sects of it who disagree with one another on this or that point. This is not to say that Islam does not have very real implications for the people who inhabit specific areas of the world, such as the Middle East, but rather this is to emphasize how the concept and representations of an Islamic world are created, especially by people who consider themselves apart from that world, and not actually absolute geocultural truths. So, to summarize, Orientalism as a style of thought is a way to imagine, create, or make representations of the Orient. These representations often juxtapose the East and the West to emphasize Western superiority and Eastern inferiority and otherness. This process is called Orientalization, so to imagine the Orient is to Orientalize. Therefore, the Orient may have real-world implications, but it only exists insofar as it has been Orientalized. Each person's orient looks and feels a little different from one another. Therefore, it is more accurate to say that there are many orients, and the orient, as a European concept, is the stage upon which representers imagine those orients. Finally, these representations became structured into European understandings of geography, thus creating Orientalism's imaginative geography. The two spaces of East and West were not only physically distinct, but qualitatively opposite of one another ultimately two separate worlds. Part 3. Orientalism as a Discipline When we talk about Orientalism as a style of thought, it becomes very abstract. But when we talk about Orientalism as a discipline, we can see that there is a material manifestation of Orientalizing thought. As a process, Orientalization is much more than simply a few European men sitting around imagining the Orient. Orientalization occurs through writing, archiving, editing, translating, painting, drawing, photographing, filming, displaying, exhibiting, on and on. Orientalism therefore becomes a highly systemized and even scholarly or scientific body of knowledge based in representations of the Orientalized Other. Orientalism as a discipline becomes a European approach to dealing with and understanding Asia and the Middle East. And it is through Orientalism as a discipline that Orientalism as a style of thought really spread throughout the world. As I mentioned earlier, Orientalization can be found in literature from as early as ancient Greece. But when we discuss Orientalism as a discipline, we are actually talking about a modern system of knowledge about the Orient that really began in the mid-18th into the early 19th century. Said suggests that there are two principal elements of the relationship between Europe and Asia that changed in the 18th century and provided for the development of Orientalism as a modern discipline. One of these elements is that what were formerly the distant lands of Asia were now becoming connected to Europe through colonial imperial endeavors. So, European people had much more access to the Orient than they had had before. This context, coupled with the growing scientization of European knowledge in response to Enlightenment thinking. Modern disciplines like ethnology, anatomy, philology, and history solidified, and scholars in these fields also took interest in this Orient opening under European colonization. The other element is how, because this connection came through colonization, the West was always in a position of strength in relation to the East. The West was colonizer, the East colonized. This further indicated the preconceived belief, held since ancient times before, that the relationship between the West and the East was always one of superior West versus inferior East. Said argues that it was the French Orientalist of the latter 18th century, Sylvester de Sassi, who really systemized Orientalism into a modern discipline. De Sassi put much effort into collecting and archiving literature about or from the Orient and translating ancient Arabic texts for French speakers. But what was most important was how almost everything de Sassi did was geared specifically towards students. He designed what really became the first pedagogy for Orientalism. Said interprets that there were two main aspects to his pedagogy. One was de Sassi's role as the didactic presenter of the material, and the other was his repeated extraction from and revision of existing texts to create that material. Therefore, students received only snapshots of texts that de Sassi had carefully curated and personally translated, 
and de Sassi maintained his position as an unquestionable expert, transmitting obscure knowledge to students. Said particularly notes that much of his work has a personal tone to it, as in this example from his Principles of General Grammar that he wrote specifically for his son. Most of de Sassi's original works are anthologies or general surveys that take extracts from different texts and paste them together to form arguments without much consideration for those texts' contexts. In retrospect, it's something that we might call misrepresenting data. And what is most important is that de Sassi could not be challenged. What he said about the Orient went, and his material supported him, and his students could only accept it. Following in de Sassi's footsteps during the 19th century was Ernest Renan, a French philologist turned Orientalist. Said argues that Renan gave Orientalism its discourse, or its methods and rhetoric. Philology is an old, now archaic discipline dedicated to understanding the origin of language and languages, and in doing so, it became highly taxonomic, based on comparative grammar. But this was not like today's discipline of linguistics that focuses a lot on spoken language and has a very organized way of representing data. Rather, it was based on comparing ancient texts, particularly religious texts, as an attempt to find the original language and thus the origins of humanity. So what Renan brought to Orientalism was this comparative method, and it can be particularly seen in his general history and comparative system of Semitic languages. In this work, Renan consistently compares the Semitic languages with Indo-European languages, and he also draws connections between language and biology and historical cultural development. Renan does this while arguing for Indo-European supremacy over what he describes as a defunct original Semitic language and the race of people that was supposed to have spoken it. Said interprets that Renan's work demonstrates how modern Orientalism created categories based on European supremacy, but with a facade of science. Renan had no existing tangible or physical, let alone linguistic, evidence that there existed a so-called original Semitic people and language. He created this new Orientalized category while incorporating his contemporary biases into it and backed it up through a comparative method, understood as scientific, and by connecting it to other burgeoning disciplines. As we discussed before with imaginative geography, the land became the people, the people became the land. Well, in modern Orientalism as a discipline, everything Oriental, or in Renan's case specifically Semitic, was diminished into a singular connected and absolute category inferior to its European counterpart. Language was biology, history, and culture. Biology was language, history, and culture. History was biology, language, and culture, on and on. So Orientalism as a modern discipline, as we have discussed so far, is a process of editing, representing, comparing, categorizing, and diminishing the Orient. But there are two other important aspects that Said discusses that we need to consider in order to understand Orientalism as a modern discipline. One is that Orientalists were overwhelmingly more interested in the ancient or classical Orient than they were in the Orient contemporary to their time. So when Orientalists traveled to the areas that they studied, they were often disappointed that the Orient was not like the ancient texts. This indicated to Orientalists how the Orient had degenerated from its classical glory, further entrenching Western superiority and Eastern inferiority as the basic Orientalist assumption. And we can see in both de Sassi and Ron's approaches how the ancient texts related to the Orient became the basis for their research, whether it was the earliest people who were supposed to have spoken Renan's original Semitic language, or the extracts of classic Arabic and Islamic texts that de Sassi compiled. Another aspect that I sort of referenced earlier was the secularization of previously religious paradigms in the study of the Orient. This, of course, coincides with the Enlightenment era of the 18th century and the proliferation in Europe of the belief that rational thinking could achieve answers to anything rather than supernatural or spiritual explanations. Philology itself as a discipline, well before Renan applied it to Orientalism, attempted to explain the origins of language based on the biblical explanation of an original divine language split at the Tower of Babel. It functioned with this goal until Sanskrit was found to be older than Hebrew near the late 18th century. But the discipline and its method of comparison and creating categories remained, even though the basic goal changed from one of religious significance to secularized thinking.
and as we saw with Renan's work, it especially kept its Western superiority complex. It is this secularization of religious study that allowed Orientalism to become a widespread and perceived scientific discipline in the 19th century. So what did the research of Orientalists who actually went to Asia, the Middle East, or North Africa look like in comparison to de Sassi and Renan, who primarily did research without much travel? Well, Said identifies three kinds of Orientalists with somewhat different attitudes in their writing about the Orient in the Orient. One is the Orientalist who presents their personal observations as scientific information. Put another way, they pass subjectivity as objectivity. Another is the Orientalist who similarly views their personal observations as scientific, but does not do a very good job of erasing the traces of their personal sentiments. And the third is the Orientalist who felt that their trip and observations in the Orient were a part of a larger personal project, and therefore their work is very obviously subjective and highly aestheticized. And Said clarifies that while there are these three types of prominent writing styles, texts often exhibit each of them at different points. One of the literary examples that Said interprets is Edward William Lane's An Account of the Manners and Customs of Modern Egyptians, 1836. Lane was British and spent two residences in Egypt before publishing the book. Originally, he went to Egypt to learn Arabic, but during his first stay, he also wrote down some of his observations about modern Egypt and was later encouraged to return to Egypt to complete a work about it. Said asserts that Lane was likely most influenced by the French publication Description de l'Egypte from 1809, about which I will talk in the next section. The main point to make about Lane's modern Egyptians is its point of view. Said describes how, in the work, the essential relationship between Lane and the Egyptians was a one-way exchange, as they spoke and behaved, he observed and wrote down. Even though Lane exists among Egyptian people, able to communicate in the language, and also tried to adapt to whatever customs, he also positioned himself apart from it as observer. And it is the ego of the observer that really shines through the work, as Lane consistently evokes a first-person perspective. So, as Said describes, Lane becomes both the exhibit and the exhibitor. Lane was supposed to be representing Egyptian people and society, but in reality, he was presenting his own experience with it and his own opinions. An example that Said uses from the text is how Lane treats his supposed friend, Sheikh Ahmed, in the preface. Lane portrays Ahmed as a glass eater and a polygamist, and then relates a story about how Lane essentially convinced Ahmed to risk his own security and take Lane into a mosque so that Lane could pretend to pray like a Muslim and experience what that might be like. Already, that is pretty screwed up. But what Said emphasizes is how, through all of this, Lane gets closer and closer to Egyptian people physically, but he gets further and further from Egyptian people in identity, or in more philo philosophical terms, ontologically. Lane can play Egyptian or Muslim, but he never wants to actually be Egyptian or Muslim, nor does he ever actually view Egyptian or Muslim people as more than informants or specimens. Furthermore, through Lane's observations and experiences, people like Ahmed become the archetype of all Muslim people. What Ahmed does, Lane represents as essentially what all Muslim people do, supposedly. So, as Lane becomes less and less like the Muslim and the Egyptian, his opinions and descriptions seem or feel more and more objective, as if he is seeing people like Ahmed from a removed and omniscient and therefore rational perspective. Therefore, Lane's narrative serves to Europeanize himself and orientalize the people, places, and things of Egypt about which he writes, more than to give an objective account of how Egyptian people live. A final note that I have about Orientalism as a discipline is something that Said discusses in great detail. Scholarly Orientalism had great influence on authors who were not academic Orientalists like de Sassi, Renan, or Lane, but were still interested in the Orient or wanted to write about it. These types of authors Said calls Oriental enthusiasts, and they include the likes of Flaubert and Marx, as we discussed in the previous section. So, although they were not professional scholarly Orientalists, nor did they belong to the institutions of Orientalism, they still enjoyed Orientalist literature and referenced it in their own works to prove their points about the Orient. To summarize, 
Orientalism as a discipline concerns the material and institutional forms of Orientalism, such as literature and art, Orientalists and scholarly societies, all that spread Orientalism as a style of thought. Said suggests that Orientalism became a modern discipline with the advent of a pedagogy and comparative research method from the work of the French Orientalists Sylvester de Sassi and Ernest Renan in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. During this time, Orientalism underwent a scientization and secularization that made it feel more rational and objective. The main issue in Orientalist research and literature is the observer or author's ego. As the European observer comes closer physically to the Oriental observed, the European observer becomes further ontologically from the Oriental observed. This creates a facade of objectivity and rationality when in reality the claims are purely subjective and contextual. Finally, the discipline of Orientalism has influenced writing outside of itself in what Said calls Oriental enthusiast literature. Part 4. Orientalism as Power By now you might be wondering, well, we have talked about Orientalism as a style of thought and as a discipline, but why does all of this Orientalism stuff really matter? So far, it just seems like a bunch of white men misrepresenting Asia and peoples of Asia for other white audiences. Were there any real impacts on Asia due to Orientalism? The answer is undoubtedly yes, and that is how we get to Orientalism as a hegemony, or as Said put it, a Western means of dominating the Orient. The reason that we can consider Orientalism a hegemony is because, as a style of thought and as a discipline, Orientalism validated and supported Western imperialism and colonialism, particularly during the 19th and 20th centuries. This is to say that Orientalism provided the epistemological and ontological basis for European imperialism in the Orient. Said suggests that Orientalism took this hegemonic turn during the Napoleonic invasion of Egypt and eventually Syria in 1798. Although Napoleonic dominance over these countries did not last too long, Napoleon's process of invasion and takeover was much different from previous European attempts to expand their empire into North Africa and the Middle East. One aspect was how Napoleon, since his childhood, was personally inspired by Orientalist literature, specifically Francois Auguier de Marigny's Histoire des Arabes, that glorified Alexander the Great's conquering of the Middle East and Egypt. Napoleon had come to view himself as a modern Alexander. We can see not only how widely read Orientalist literature was in the late 18th century, but how it could also inspire European imperial endeavors. Of course, Napoleon also thought conquering Egypt would be a great feat to show the British that the French were just as powerful. But when we consider where Napoleon's idea about European dominance over Egypt came from, it seems to be more directly linked to the orientalized representation of Egypt succumbing to Macedonian Greek civilization, from whom Western civilization was believed, at least somewhat, to have evolved, and not merely from the political economic competition between the two early modern European empires. So we can see how Orientalism as a style of thought and discipline provoked Orientalism as Western domination and vice versa. But what may be the most starkly modern and Orientalist aspect of the Napoleonic invasion was that Napoleon took with his army a team of Orientalists, European experts on Egypt, Islam, and the like, who served as his advisors. These included Sylvester de Sassi, who we discussed earlier. And it was their vision of Egypt, based on the classical texts of the Orient, that really guided Napoleon's beliefs about Egypt and the way that he would come to rule it. Said argues that this was the first time a European power attempted to rule through ideology rather than brute military force. From the beginning, Napoleon's strategy was to convince the Egyptians that he was on their side against the Mameluke regime, and that his people, the French, were the true Muslims. His team of Orientalists were his mediators in everything. They translated everything Napoleon proclaimed into Quranic Arabic, and they disseminated it among the Egyptians. They also tried to persuade the religious leaders to interpret the Quran in favor of the French by using incentives like military honors. And it worked. Eventually, Egyptians were more trusting of the French occupiers. Finally, when Napoleon left Egypt, he didn't put military personnel in charge of administration. 
Rather, he put the French Orientalists and the persuaded Islamic leaders in charge. Out of this too came the Institut d'Egypte and the Description de l'Egypte that we discussed earlier. C describes that these two developments are indicative of another new aspect of European domination. He says, the other part was to render Egypt completely open, to make it totally accessible to European scrutiny, from being a land of obscurity and a part of the Orient hitherto known at second hand through the exploits of earlier travelers, scholars, and conquerors, Egypt was to become a department of French learning. Of course, this attitude resulted in the establishment of the Institut, and Description de l'Egypte reflects this further. Description focuses on Egypt as an historically significant area in the relationship between the East and the West, full of memories of past glory. According to Description, anyone who wanted power wanted Egypt, and the fact that Napoleon and the French Empire could take it indicated their greatness. And it was this vision of a glorious Egypt of the ancient past, whether self-governed or under Greek influence, that also demonstrated contemporary Egypt's barbarism. It was based upon this vision of the Orient that many Western nations would come to validate their imperial endeavors in Asia and the Middle East. As Said describes beautifully in this quote, I suggest that you take a moment to pause and read it. Over the course of the 19th century, a select few European empires came to control via annexation and colonization almost the entirety of Asia. Some notable British imperial endeavors brought India, Burma, Egypt, Java, the port city of Singapore, and several Chinese Qing dynasty port cities like Hong Kong and Shanghai under British control. French imperial endeavors brought from Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, from China, a section of Shanghai, Guangzhou, Hong Kong, and Tianjin, and from the Middle East, Syria, and Lebanon under French control. Although not until the very end of the century, the United States also gained control over the Philippines and many places in the Pacific, such as Samoa, Palau, and Guam. Some of these came through active imperialism, such as the French takeover of Vietnam from the Nguyen dynasty. Others came through European powers fighting each other, such as the British annexation of Java from the Dutch and the US American annexation of the Philippines from the Spanish. Such history reflects one of the basic principles of Orientalism, Europe speaking for the Orient. And of course, with all of these imperial efforts came the Orientalist Institutes and the spread of Orientalist knowledge globally. By the 20th century, European knowledge about the Orient had not only helped such powers orchestrate imperialism, it also evidenced the European right to rule over the Orient. Said opens the first chapter of Orientalism with a discussion about former British Prime Minister Arthur James Balfour's lecture to the House of Commons from 1910. Balfour is answering this question, what right have you to take up these airs of superiority with regard to people whom you choose to call Oriental? As quoted here, Said notes how the two main themes of Balfour's response are knowledge and power. To Balfour, our knowledge of them gives us the authority. And as he continues, this becomes more evident. Because the British know Egyptian civilization, the British know that Oriental societies do not demonstrate the ability for self-government. And because the British know this, it is a fact. Finally, such knowledge demonstrates to the British that Egypt does not have this capacity for self-government. British occupation is actually gracious, righteous, and beneficial to both the Orient and Europe. Although an Egyptian person or people never actually offer their own views on the subject, Balfour simply speaks for them. And Balfour sentiments are not unique, especially among pro-imperialist, European, and U.S. American politicians. Theodore Roosevelt expressed similar opinions about the righteousness of colonization in his 1909 speech, Expansion of the White Races, that he delivered at a celebration of Methodist missionary work in Africa. When again, he speaks for the colonized in saying essentially that, Although imperialism has definitely had its injustices, overall colonized people are better off now than they were in their so-called primitive state before Euro European or Euro-American dominance. In summary, what we began discussing as a matter of representation became a much more active force of power. Orientalism as a Western means of domination over the Orient may be understood as the cycle between knowledge of and power over 
and they continuously reproduce and validate one another. European knowledge of the Orient not only informed imperialist strategies, it also evidenced the European right to rule. European power over the Orient further supplied access for European people to create knowledge about the Orient. They say that knowledge is power, and this is certainly true, but Orientalism demonstrates that, in addition, power is also knowledge. Part 5. Contemporary Orientalism Said actually dedicates the entire last part of Orientalism to Orientalism since World War II. As you probably know, World War II severely changed everything about who had world power, particularly shifting the center of world dominance from Western Europe, i.e. Britain and France, to the United States. Said says that the United States was never really an empire until the 21st century, primarily after the Spanish-American War. But this is actually not true. The U.S. was an empire since its inception, and U.S. global policy is rooted directly in Euro-American imperial colonial expansion, particularly genocide against the indigenous peoples of North America and Mexico. However, as Said argues rightfully, the U.S. became the primary beneficiary and proliferator of Orientalism as thought, discipline, and power after World War II. And I think almost anyone in the world can relate to this personally. For those of us born after World War II, we really have not known a United States that was not heavily invested, especially militaristically, in the Middle East and Asia. We have never known a China, North Korea, or Vietnam that wasn't at least partly supposed to be a communist threat, or an Islam that wasn't at least partly supposed to be a terrorist threat to American democracy. We have never even heard of a Palestine that wasn't the antithesis to Israel. And as Saeed discusses, these images of Asian and Middle Eastern anti-American others pervade almost every aspect of U.S. American politics and popular culture. And this is, although by today's standards not new, to Saeed the newest, most recent form of Orientalism and Orientalization, focused specifically on representing Asia and the Middle East as threats to Western capitalist democratic values, while recycling Orientalized tropes that also support white supremacy, Zionism, or Christian supremacy. But of course, as most of us in 2021 understand, the so-called values of Western capitalism and democracy are just as much imagined unrealistic and self-contradictory as the Orientalized tropes that support them. Of course, one of the biggest changes, however, is the relationship between academic Orientalism and the nation-state polity. As you can probably imagine, Said's Orientalism essentially made everyone want to disassociate with the term Orientalism, and also really critically consider their relationship between their research and the larger political implications that their research might serve. Like I mentioned in the introduction, it is extremely rare to see or hear the word Orientalism in academia today. Instead, academia has divided itself up into area studies fields, such as East Asian studies, which I did my master's in, Middle Eastern Studies, Islamic Studies, South Asian Studies, Southeast Asian Studies, Near Eastern Studies, the list goes on and on. Now, it's still true that a lot of people who go through these degree programs do take on political positions, such as becoming lobbyists or employees in the CIA. But generally, people at the position similar to like DeSasi, university faculty, rarely serve specifically, want to serve, or let alone write in support of U.S. dominance over the areas in which they specialize. Of course, these people are often sought out by journalists to comment on specific issues, and Said himself criticized journalists for doing this, but nonetheless, university faculty very rarely actively try to support epistemologically U.S. or Western dominance over the world. Finally, popular visual culture is oversaturated with orientalized representations of Asian and Middle Eastern peoples. American military movies certainly reproduce these tropes over and over again, as Middle Eastern and Islamic people attack or try to foil American military plans, even though the U.S. is the one who invaded their home, making the U.S. seem like the victim. Many films also include Asian or Arab actors only as villains pitted against a predominantly white cast of protagonists or as one-dimensional comedic relief citing a white lead role. And of course, Oriental mysticism, no matter how far-fetched and culturally inaccurate, has not ceased to pervade popular films. These are just a few ways that Orientalism continues to incorporate Western popular visual culture. Of course, there have been great strides in popular visual culture to tell the stories of Asian and Middle Eastern peoples from their own perspectives. But unless Warner Brothers, Disney, and similarly dominant corporations in TV and film 
who've historically benefited from Orientalism die really soon, Orientalized representations are likely to stick around for quite a while. To help you continue working with Orientalism, I have created an Orientalism self-help guide for anyone interested. It includes three sections. The first section provides summaries of each of the main sections of this lecture, primarily by means of definitions. The second section offers helpful questions that you can use to interrogate Orientalism next time you are reading something and thinking that it might be a little problematic. These questions are just the ones that I use, and I try to explain how you should go about contemplating them in order to achieve the best answer. Remember that critical thinking takes practice, so do not expect to be able to explain everything perfectly the first time you try to discuss that something is orientalizing. The last part of the guide includes Edward Said's bibliography and a bibliography of works that also deal with orientalism. I am pretty sure I listed all of Said's books, but if I missed some, I am sorry. The bibliography of further reading is not exhaustive because there are so many books dealing with orientalism, it would take a village to compile the most extensive list. However, these are either ones that I have also read, regardless of if I like it or, not, or hate it, or ones that I have seen are pretty popular. I especially tried to include ones related to visual and material culture. I think it would be really cool if we started a community bibliography of written works on Orientalism, so maybe I will try to start that. I will let you all know. Thank you all so much for listening to this lecture. I hope that you learned at least one thing that can enhance your life or research. If you have any questions, please reach out in the comments below, and I will do my best to address them. Please check out the Coalition of Master Scholars on Material Cultures website for weekly publications for Master Scholars, symposium opportunities, and cool merchandise. You can also like and follow CMSMC on Instagram and Facebook. Please also look out for my article to be published as part of the CMSMC online journal in October concerning the role of Orientalism in U.S. American Museums. Have a wonderful day!